Hey! Hi! Welcome back to our show. My name is Kathy. My name is Celeste. And today Celeste is going to be telling the story, and I have no idea what it is, and I don't have my contacts in, so I don't know what the story is. But buckle in, <laughs> and let's have a fun time. So today I'm going to be telling you guys about the Stonewall Uprising. <gasps> yeah. Oh my god! Have you ever heard about that? Just kidding. <laughs> wow, I'm so happy. Yeah, so in order to tell you about the Stonewall Uprising, there's a couple people that I have to tell you about first. And the first one is Marsha P. Johnson, one of the most prominent activists of the gay rights movement in the 1960s and 70s was Marsha P. Johnson in New York City. Mm -hmm. She was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey in 1945, making her a Virgo. She was born into a black working class family and she was assigned male at birth. She was the fifth of seven children. When she was five years old, she would start wearing dresses. Her family and like people in the neighborhood were not accepting of that. She would get bullied by neighborhood kids a lot and unfortunately she was sexually assaulted when she was a little girl um and so she stopped wearing the clothes that she was most comfortable in that's so sad her parents were malcolm michael senior an assembly line worker at general motors and alberta claiborne a housekeeper and they were methodist and in this case pretty homophobic her mother expressed to marcia that being gay was lower than a dog <gasps> oh, that's horrible yeah and had no interest in learning about the LGBT community, obviously. It was in the 50s and 60s, so people were very ignorant. Mm. like, uh, And a lot more prejudiced. Gosh. Very close-minded. Yeah, that's horrible to be a kid and go through that and then, you know, yeah, have that be reiterated at home. Yeah, absolutely. And when she was 17 years old, she fled to New York City. She was like, I'm getting out of this house. Mm. She arrived in New York City with a bag of clothes and $15. That's all she had. Wow. That's when she adopted the full name Marsha P. Johnson. The P standing for pay it no mind. And she would say that when people would ask about her gender. She would just <laughs> say pay it no mind. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And because there were many more spaces for her to feel like safe in mm -hmm. there was more of an opportunity for her to be herself including self-expression in drag and so that's when she started her drag her drag adventure wow she wasn't like a lot of the other drag queens because she was actually living on the street so she didn't have you know the same kinds of really well put together wigs and makeup that the other drag queens had mm -hmm. she would just have to rifle through the trash or find things at the thrift and make her costumes out of that wow yeah what about and, us yeah and it didn't matter because she had such a magnetic energy that it didn't matter what she was wearing. She could perform in a trash bag and people would still show up and like they just were addicted to her energy. Oh, wow. She had a really loud stage performance. People said that she was really bad at singing, but like <laughs> she was she was just so proud of who she was and she was unapologetic. Oh. Yeah. Which was very rare back then, you know? Mm -hmm. It was bold to be who you are back then, especially if you were trans or gay. Yeah, that's so powerful. She would stand tall at protests and even when being arrested, and she would never change her personality or act differently to appease anybody. Like, everyone like always judged her for wearing women's clothing and she didn't care at all she just was herself she encouraged other people to be themselves as well she was really loud and proud about it it wasn't the norm for people to be themselves in that way at that time yeah it, this kind of reminds me of that one show a league of their own where um we had that trans uncle oh yeah mm -hmm. right and he was like super ostracized like mm -hmm. I mean, it was like unheard of back then to be trans like it was just not safe at all like even gay yeah that's crazy exactly she would stand on the street, like on the corner, or just walk down the street, or she would be at Central Park, and people would know who she was immediately. They, everyone just knew who she was. Like, they would go up to her and start taking pictures with her, and she was just an icon. Everyone knew who she was. According to her friend, Tommy Lanigan Schmidt, an activist and friend of Marsha's, people from all over the world knew who she was. Andy Warhol even photographed her, and the artwork has since then become nationally recognized. And this is the photograph of her. Oh, beautiful. I rec Yeah, it's like we recognize that. 
Yeah. That's stunning. Yeah, and the portrait is titled Ladies and Gentlemen 133, and it's one of 10 portraits that were taken in the Ladies and Gentlemen portfolio of Andy Warhol's. The original Polaroids feature 14 black and Latinx drag queens. Oh, I love yeah. it. And through the series, Andy Warhol embraced the identity and sexuality of the queer and drag queen community. Wow! While addressing socio-political issues surrounding the LGBT community, which was not, again, was not done at the time. Yeah. So it was, I thought that was really cool. That's so cool. This is kind of like just a random fact, but when I was a kid, I was obsessed with Andy Warhol. Mm. And I'm like, that makes sense you know <laughs> yeah because his art was obviously because his art was like it's just so bright and colorful and like i remember seeing that art when i was a kid and like seeing her portrait specifically wow. and knowing that she was important i just didn't know why yeah kind of yeah. like a full circle moment now <laughs> yeah that's so awesome cool. yeah and although she had no difficulty in her self-expression she had trouble finding work work was you know hard to come by especially for people in the lgbtq community mm -hmm. it wasn't like you know people were not accepted it was literally illegal to be gay she turned to sex work where she was often abused and like harassed by the police and by her like clients on multiple occasions guns had been pulled out on marcia and at one point she even had been shot in the leg oh my god it was obviously really difficult for her because she never had a permanent home and according to the documentary pay it no mind the life and times of marcia p johnson many people adored her and unlike most people in new york city she was really kind and genuine like she would stand out and ask people do you have a dollar for a dying drag queen they would give her money and she would turn around and give it to somebody who needed food mm. she would turn around and give it to the next like houseless person and she would say get yourself something to eat that's just the kind of person that she was wow. or when she would do drag she would have like a brooch on or like a piece of jewelry on and if one of the girls commented on it or said that they liked it she would just give it to them wow yeah so beautiful yeah because she was adored she found places to stay throughout the city luckily mm. and one of the places that she would stay was underneath a table of a flower market they would have these like big tables full of flowers and it was owned by like an indian family and one day one of the friends of marcia was like why are you letting her sleep under the flower tables and they were like because she's holy and people just like adored her wow yeah and i think that and they would give her they would actually give her flowers to put in her hair so she could mm. use those to perform drag oh and my belief is that maybe she made some money off of that and gave the money back for the flowers they gave her mm. i don't know for sure but because she was so giving that i think maybe that's why mm. that's so beautiful or maybe just because she was kind yeah and it was 99 cents to see a matinee at the time, so she would buy matinee tickets and go sleep up there sometimes. Mm. She would find places to stay, hotels or bath houses. But it's like she was literally black trans youth living on the street, and so it was not a safe place for her to be. Yeah, that's so scary. It's scary to think about everything our trans youth is facing right now, and like, you know, not to get too much into that, but just this, it just it's frustrating because trans people deserve safety and protection yeah you know absolutely like trans women everybody yeah you know absolutely yeah and shortly after arriving to new york city at 17 years old marcia met 11 year old sylvia rivera who was also a trans little girl marcia took sylvia under her wing and just like took care of her mm -hmm. and like sylvia would call marcia mother a bit of background on sylvia she was of Puerto Rican and Venezuelan descent, and she was born on July 2nd, 1951, making her a cancer. And her father abandoned her when she was a baby, and then when she was three, her mom unalived herself. Sylvia was sent to live with her grandmother, who was not accepting of her feminine behavior. Um, and in fourth grade, Sylvia actually started to wear makeup, and like her grandma really hated it, and so before her grandma could kick her out she left and being women of color and trans on top of that in the 60s life was not easy for them but they were about to change things and this is where we get into the stonewall inn 
in the 60s and 70s, being gay was illegal. And it was so looked down upon that it was literally considered a sickness. People would be sent to psychiatric facilities for being gay. There were heaps of crimes that gay people would be charged with. Um, for example, holding hands, dancing together. They Even if like it was a room full of people and there was one gay person in there, it, it would be considered disorderly. So like, they literally were arrested just for being gay and that's not that's not even like that's not even talking about the trans issues at hand Mm -hmm. that's just in reference in reference to gay people wow if the cops didn't feel like the clothes fit the gender they would they could arrest um it was this 1845 statute which made it a crime to masquerade in other words dress in like the opposite gender clothing or to do drag and that was just straight up illegal so if you were dressed in drag or you were dressed in even just a dress or a shirt that they didn't consider masculine or feminine enough you would get arrested that's crazy to think about yeah and around 3,000 people a year were arrested just for being gay in new york city and this was obviously a nightmare for gay people it was a huge nightmare for closeted gay people Mm -hmm. and it produced an enormous amount of anger within the community because people were outraged you know and of course black and brown people especially trans people and drag queens got the brunt of like the violence and harassment yeah from society and from police Mm -hmm. so they found refuge in gay bars you know Mm -hmm. these were safe spaces where they could go and be themselves Mm-hmm. And even though they were considered usually considered safer, gay bars were usually owned by the mafia. So, like, they weren't that much safer. The mafia, they owned the jukeboxes and the vending machines. They would water down the drinks and make people pay extra for drinks. Wow. They would extort some of the patrons and blackmail them. If they were, like, wealthy, they would be like, I'm going to tell your whole family or I'm going to tell your work that you're gay. Or I'm going to go to the cops, like, and just hold that against them. And some of the bartenders, like, or people in the mafia that were at the bar, like, some of them were just straight up, like, would just be straight up homophobic. Ooh. Yeah. And on top of that, because the gay bars were raided so often, they were usually pretty dirty and dingy. Like, there were some nicer ones. There were a lot of street kids that would go in there. There were a lot of sex workers that would go in there. And, like, that was illegal back then. So these places weren't, like, super clean and you know well put together Mm -hmm. and on top of that the windows would get broken out a lot so the windows would usually be boarded up and the stonewall inn was no different according to most it was owned by the mafia and to some it was like a little piece of heaven you know for sylvia and marcia and other street kids like this was a place they could go and, and be safe and you know have drinks and just be able to relax yeah specifically at the stonewall inn the police would raid the bar pretty frequently Mm -hmm. because they didn't have a liquor license that was their excuse but most likely it was because they wanted to beat on gay people Mm -hmm. or arrest gay people Mm -hmm. the customers that were targeted the most were of course black and brown trans people and drag queens and usually because marcia and sylvia were really proud of who they were they would be the ones at the front lines like taking the beatings you know they were the ones like fighting the cops off standing proud yelling at the cops you know sometimes they would be arrested for no reason at all even if they weren't at the bar if they were just literally standing there so they would just get arrested for no reason at all marcia stopped counting her arrest after 100. wow yeah that's crazy yeah she sounds so cool and brave and like charismatic yeah Violence against trans women and gay people back then was so severe that, like, if you were gay and you saw a cop, you would just run the other way. Because if you didn't, you would get beaten. And some people got beaten so severely that they would get paralyzed. They would get severe brain injuries where they couldn't function normally after. Or sometimes they would even end up dead. Yeah. There was no justice back then. Like, violence against trans women, uh, like, in black trans women and women of color like it's always been there and this side that you're showing us it's you're showing us how it was like back in the day and we have come such a long way but we have a long way to go like we need to protect our trans youth like our trans commune brothers and sisters period siblings all of them like yeah yeah absolutely i agree Mm -hmm. 
people didn't want to accept this behavior from cops anymore. They didn't want to like accept the treatment that they were getting from cops anymore. You know,、mm-hmm. they were getting sick of it, and because the raids at Stonewall were so frequent, people were getting more and more like I think the energy was just getting more and more angsty. This was on June twenty eighth. 1969. Sylvia Rivera is on the dance floor with her lover, and they're just dancing. She's on drugs, drinking, having a good time, and all of a sudden, she sees that the cops are raiding the bar. Drag queens start getting filed out, and then the next thing that happens is a little bit unclear. So I'm gonna go over three interpretations of what happened next. Oh, okay. Number one, Sylvia threw the first shot glass or Molotov. Cocktail, and that started the uprising, and everyone started fighting back. Number two, Marsha threw the first cocktail glass, and the uprising began. Most people say that this is unlikely, though, because Marsha didn't get there until 2 a.m. Oh, okay. So she didn't get there until way later. And thirdly, there are four independent accounts of a butch that was getting attacked by police. She was fighting them hard. And she was a big, like, muscular butch, you know. There's like four or five cops on her, and she's fighting them off. And she's like, "What are you doing there? Why are you all just standing there?" Because I guess people weren't like helping her. And that's when the crowd just <gasps> went wild. <sighs> This is the most likely account because、uh, because it's four eyewitnesses that saw it. Some people say that the butch that was getting beaten on was Stormy at the library. She worked as a bouncer at the during the time, and here's a picture of her. Oh my gosh, she is so handsome. I know. Wow, what a babe. I know. I love the fitted suit. Ah,、oh, I know. So funny. A lot of people said it was her. Sometimes she would take credit, and sometimes she wouldn't. So it's a little bit unclear on if it was her for sure. But most people think that it was. So this、oh. is the most likely series of events. Is Stormy was getting attacked, and then people were like, "No." Oh my gosh. One thing is clear. And that is that people were pissed. People were upset. They started throwing things. The objects were being thrown. The people were finally fighting back. Wow! And people were grabbing stones from tree pits lined from the street that looked like this. <gasps> like they were grabbing those little bricks and stones and throwing them straight up, like throwing them at police officers, <laughs> throwing them at like you know their cars. Wow! People were calling the cops coppers and throwing pennies at them. Really, just trying to make their lives hell. They would like pinch their butts. <laughs> <laughs> and、um, five buses of cops arrived in riot gear. Of course, they did. The queens faced the police. The drag queens faced the police in riot gear, and they started doing rocket style kicking lines, <laughs> singing, "We are the Stonewall Girls. We wear our hair in curls. We don't wear underwear. We show our pubic hair." Oh wow! The cops attacked them with bats and tried to beat them, and this caused more uproar. People were like, "This went on all night." The cops got hurt that night. People are, are fighting back, you know. Police went into the bar to light it on fire, and they the patrons locked them inside the bar. <laughs> yeah, the cops had been abusing, harassing, and targeting these customers for years. Now it was their turn to get their f- revenge, you know. Like they were ready to fight back, and so they did. And guns were drawn. It became a riot. Cars were flipped over, tires were slashed. Like people were throwing trash cans, lighting trash cans on fire. Like wow, people were pissed. Eventually, there were about six cops inside the bar, and then like the riot cops outside. And the six cops outside the bar were able to escape. The crowd outside started to get so big that there were a thousand people participating in the riot. Wow! And they had so many cops in riot gear that they started they started to form a phalanx, which is where they like get all their shields up and they line、oh, up like that. Oh yeah! And so they were pushing the crowd back. They're on the street. And they're pushing the crowd this way, and the cr- because there were so many people, they went around the block, <laughs> and were like surrounding the cops on both sides of the street. Wow! So they couldn't push them away because they were in the middle. This went on over and over and over. They would like push the other way, and then people would come from the other side. And, like they were just like it just went on all night. Wow! And this was the moment that really catapulted 
the gay movement you know Mm -hmm. this was the moment where people were like no this isn't okay for you to just come in beat us up arrest us for no reason like we're done we're over this other groups joined the movement like the black panthers and anti-war activists aka like hippies back then Mm. on the first anniversary of the stonewall uprising june 28th 1970 the first gay pride marches took place in new york city chicago and los angeles and thousands of people came to support oh. LGBT rights at that time, which was really cool. And we've had Pride every June since then. So even though people were becoming a lot more open-minded, like, towards gay rights and, like, you know, straight people were now joining the movement, mm-hmm. it still was not a super open space for trans people. And, like, they didn't even have the term for non-binary back then, but, like, trans people specifically didn't feel like they had a space you know especially trans women of color Mm -hmm. marsha like marsha often stated that like the drag queens would treat her worse than their own pets saying that they would refer to her as an it and like just look down on her oh my god while in the movement sylvia felt like the middle class white people were kind of like gatekeepy of the movement like the gay the gays and the straights like she just felt like it was kind of like excluding her you know Mm -hmm. which was wild because like her and marcia had kind of led these movements in a way Mm -hmm. you know like they're the ones that are taking the beatings they're the ones that are targeted by the police and by society the most and here they are at the fourth you know at the front lines of the riots and the protests and they're not being prioritized in the movement Mm. that's how they felt Mm -hmm. so because they like felt unaccepted in the one space where they felt like they should feel accepted they decided to create an organization of their own (gasps) which was called the star organization it stood for street transaction revolutionaries They were the first group in the United States to organize explicitly around trans rights and self-determination. And they were deeply concerned about the safety of trans youth on the streets and like these, you know, kids who have been kicked out of their homes, have nowhere to go, don't have food, don't have safety. They don't have safety from police or society. Mm -hmm. So that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to create a space where it was like a shelter for trans kids to go to. So that's what they did. They created this organization the first shelter that they had was in the back of a trailer and that didn't go well because the owner of the trailer ended up driving away <laughs> but oh that's not funny <laughs> yeah but they and it is kind of funny (laughs) but they ended up getting a new shelter at a burnt down facility that they renovated and they would supply you know shelter they would split rent and food and they would help you know they would just help them with their lives that's so beautiful yeah and eventually the organization disbanded and although the collective and star were really short-lived sylvia and marcia continued their activism they both became trans activist icons Mm -hmm. and their efforts paved the way later for other trans activists such as lee brewster who worked directly with star and who created the queen's liberation front pre-stonewall the queen's liberation front actually successfully fought the anti-trans laws in new york sylvia like still felt pretty ostracized from the community and so she ended up trying to unalive herself she wouldn't have lived if marcia didn't find her and take her to the hospital Mm -hmm. and after that sylvia moved out of the city because she just like wanted to be away for a little bit Mm -hmm. and she returned to the city years later after the passing of marcia p johnson in 1992 wow marcia's passing was very suspicious her body was found in the Hudson River on July 2nd in 1992. Her death was ruled a suicide, but her friends and her family didn't believe that. In fact, they like really strongly urged the police to look further into it because they were like, she would never do that. And that night she was actually planning on meeting her friend at the bar and she just never showed up. One person who was on the scene when her body was found said that she had a hole in the back of her head. And multiple people have stated that she had a hole in the back of her head. She'd been talking about dirty cops a lot. And she had also, um, it had been mentioned by other friends that there was a car full of guidos driving around the area where where Marsha would work the street. 
Mm-hmm. And somebody said that they saw her get into that car with the Guidos. The cops didn't take this seriously at all. Eventually, it ended up in protest because people were pissed. They were like, why are you not taking her death seriously? Like, there needs to be a fair investigation here. Like, they should be looking into this more. Why does she have a hole in the back of her head? You know, especially mm-hmm. when people have said, we saw her get into a car full of men. We saw, we know that she wouldn't kill herself. Like, why are they not looking into this? Yeah. So they protested and protested and still the cops just didn't take it seriously. The life and death of Marsha P. Johnson documentary on Netflix shows Victoria Cruz who takes a closer look at the case and she actually gets in contact with the lead detective that was in charge of Marsha's case at the time. Wow. And he's a huge a-hole to her on the phone and he's like, I don't want to talk about it. I have nothing to say to you. Are you a lawyer? I have nothing to say to you. Yeah, and so like he just was not willing to give her any information at all. Okay. Yeah. Her case is still considered cold. If you want to look at, if you want to watch that documentary, I would I would urge you to because there's a lot of information about her case and, you know, what could have possibly happened. That's horrible. I know. After Marsha's passing, Sylvia was, of course, devastated. Like, that was her mother, you know? That was, like, her street mother. Yeah. And, um because of that she continued to fight for trans rights after that she eventually died of liver cancer at saint vincent's manhattan hospital in 2002 at the age of 50 with her lover by her side julia murray and they have a beautiful love story they're both trans oh and it's like beautiful i feel like i tried to squeeze all this in so we could talk about the stonewall uprising but like these people that we're talking about are so amazing and influential and i couldn't fit it all into the story but it like you really should look into it further if you're interested because it's so they're amazing wow the sylvia rivera law project continues her legacy working to guarantee all people are free to determine their gender identity and expression regardless of income race and without facing harassment discrimination or violence i love that violence against trans people is something that is happening every single day in fact trans people are over four times more likely than cisgender people to be a victim of a violent crime next benedict was a 16 year old transgender student who used he they pronouns and his death was a direct result of transphobia he went into the girls bathroom following the rules of his school that had recently been changed because of the laws in the in the state he was followed by three girls who beat him up in the bathroom Next was later taken to the hospital where they died. No charges are being filed because the cops believe that there's no connection between Next's death and the fight that happened earlier that day. Um, People are still currently and actively fighting for a complete and open investigation. Um, So I'll make sure to leave some links below so you can see how you can take action on that. Society clearly has a really long way to go, and changes can occur through a variety of mechanisms, but most importantly through the actions of individuals and organizations that are working to bring about change. Activism is the key to unlocking change, and without Sylvia and Marsha, we wouldn't be where we are today as far as trans rights go. I think if you have to fight for the right to simply exist, it's worth it's worth fighting for. We can't bring back Marsha or Nex. But what we can do is we can fight to protect trans rights. We can make sure that this doesn't happen again by advocating for a transgender community and by actively fighting against transphobia when we see it in public or when we see it online. Um, I'm going to list a few ways that you can show up for our trans community today. Marsha and Sylvia's legacies extend far beyond the Stonewall Uprising. Because of them, the trans rights movement was propelled into mainstream media and has made a permanent presence that will live on forever. That is the case of the Stonewall Uprising. Good job. (laughs) Thank you. It's sad, but I think it's so important that you told this story because everybody deserves to live. Our trans youth deserve to live. Our trans black women deserve to live. That's what we're doing together by talking about this and creating a world, you know, opening the dialogue and continuing to fight for them. Exactly. Yeah, for them I'll forever be grateful and for them I'll always fight. And it makes me want to be a part of every fight for people that are trying to exist right now. You know? Yeah, dude. Absolutely. Yeah. That was beautiful. Thank you. Good job. We're gonna keep crying and finish our makeup. We'll be back. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you guys so much for being here. I hope that you enjoyed learning about our history and I hope to do more cases like this in the future. I think that it's really important for us to know about stuff like this. So maybe give us a little subscribe if you want to learn more and maybe see yeah. future videos we do about stuff like this. Yeah, exactly. Like it, subscribe. Seriously, comment. Give us a little love. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>